Okay. So we all set? We all, all set, we're yeah. We're live? We're live? Great. We're live. Uh, welcome to this semester's Rough Cut uh, se seminar series. Uh, this is the first of the semester. We've got a really great lineup, and I encourage you to go on to our website, montanaioe.org, uh, to see who we have scheduled for the remainder of the semester. We've got a full slate already lined up, ready to go, um, and they, they look very, uh, they all look very interesting. Uh, I am Rich Reddy. I'm the Associate Director of the MSU uh, branch of the Montana Institute on Ecosystems. Um, so I want to welcome you all here. Uh, I want to also introduce a visiting scholar that is doing a sabbatical here, uh, Kelly Garbach, uh, who um, is uh, joining our community. And so I want you to encourage, encourage you to say hi and get to know Kelly and find out what she's working on and look for, for any possible collaborations. She's kind of working at the intersection of social sciences and natural sciences and in various in areas, including um, beekeeping and natural pollination, those kinds of things. But she can tell us, do a better job explaining more about what she does. Um, today, our first seminar for the semester, we have Hillary Parker here from the American Prairie Reserve. Um, we had scheduled to have uh, Kyron Conkel, but uh, he had to be up at the reserve because they're having public hearings on elk hunting today. And, uh, and a town hall meeting on bison. <laughs> OK. Because so. there's nothing ever slow, ever. Right. <laughs> So we're very excited. Um, we've been talking to the American Prairie Reserve for a, a little while now to try to think about how uh, people here at MSU, how people in, in the IOE statewide can collaborate with the American Prairie Reserve on, you know, on different programs, on research. Uh, it's a, uh, I think we'll hear today what a wonderful laboratory uh, it can serve. Uh, and so one of the things that we're, we're excited about having Hillary here today is so that we can start trying to uh, build some connections and uh, see what kinds of potential research come out of that into the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hillary. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. I'm really excited to be here today for a couple of reasons. One, I've got the biggest living laboratory in the state of Montana, and we need you. And two, as long as we can figure out a way to make it work for you and for us, you can get up there tomorrow and start digging in. And I know there's a lot of red tape when it comes to doing the kind of science that you want to do. And with American Prairie Reserve, we have unique opportunity to remove a lot of that red tape. We just, as private landowners, don't have it. Um, so I want to, first of all, thank you for coming and issue you a big uh, invitation to come and do some science on the ground in this uh, soon-to-be 3.5 million acre living laboratory. So a little bit about us to start, and interrupt me at any time. I'm a very informal person. Um, I do uh, you know, outreach and, and media work, et cetera, for the reserve, but I'm also um, one of the overall managers. And so Dr. Kunkel, who couldn't be here today, sends his regrets, but he informed me very well on what's going on, and he and I coordinate a lot. So if you have specific questions, I'm happy to take them. I will address them as best I can. And then uh, give me your email, and we'll get you more specifics if you need them, OK? So today we're going to just kind of introduce the project. And I'm going to take some time to introduce what we're doing before we drill down into where you guys can help. And the reason I want to do this is pretty straightforward. Nothing like this has really ever been done before. This is really unique, and that's what makes it exciting, and that's what makes being able to be a part of it on the ground floor really exciting. So we've titled this talk, How to Build a Park, the Size, of the state of Connecticut in northeastern Montana. And only in Montana could you do that. Could you actually take, you know, carve out a piece of another state and just say, all right, we're going to do this. It's one of the great things about Montana. You guys know where this is. You've probably done some research there, hopefully, right off that trip. And you know where this is. You've hopefully been down there, maybe with some students or some teachers or some colleagues. But I bet you didn't know that the prairie out in northeastern Montana represents some of the biggest opportunity for us to study all kinds of things, whether you're interested in biology, ecology, et cetera. There's a, there's a big, vast playground. Once complete, American Prairie Reserve will be 3.5 million acres, which is bigger than both Glacier and, National, and Yellowstone National Park combined. And it will have all manner of flora and fauna returned to it, just as it did you know, in the, old, in the old days, as we like to say, before we settled it. Does that make sense? So we know that, that our Great Plains look like this today, the majority of them. Uh, and you know what? For good reason. I eat. I'm guessing you eat. Amelia eats. 
Um, we need food production out of our earth. Uh, we don't have any beef with that, no pun intended. But we also think that if we have an opportunity to preserve a great place in, you know, in our United States or in the world, a great biome, that we should do that. And so one of the things that we're doing, our mission, is pretty simple. We wanted to figure out how to preserve the grasslands, which we'd skipped over somehow when we established parks like Yellowstone, Glacier, Yosemite. We just skipped over um, that entire ecosystem. One of the reasons that we know that we need that ecosystem is that it housed all of this amazing biodiversity in ways that these other parks don't even have a chance to do. So the grasslands are important, one, because we know they're a carbon sink, right, because we know all of the wonderful um, plant species that you, can, that you can find there and study there, but also because this wildlife got pushed off of the plains into the rock and the ice where we now associate them. Well, we'd like to change that. We'd like to bring back what has been called by National Geographic an American Serengeti, so that you can have almost that Serengeti safari-style experience here in the United States. So how did this all get started? Back in 2001, uh, American Prairie Reserve was founded. And it was founded in part by efforts from World Wildlife Fund and other conservationist groups, which got together and went, shoot, the grasslands. What are we going to do? Is it even possible, possible to preserve uh, an ecosystem-sized grassland park? Is there anywhere left? Right? We know it gets tilled up routinely for plant production and cash crops. We know it gets grazed and overgrazed. Is it possible? Well, we did some research and we decided if it was possible, we would need for an ecosystem-sized restoration project between 3.2 and 3.5 million acres. Where could we find that? There were four places remaining on Earth the North American Great Plains, the Kazakh Steppe, the Mongolian Steppe, and the Patagonia Steppe. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the work that's been done in Patagonia in particular with now the late Doug and Chris Tompkins. Uh, they've done some amazing work. We actually have partners over in Kazakhstan uh, who, are, who are building an 8 million acre park. 3.5 blows my mind. To more than double that makes me crazy. Um, Kudos to them. I love that idea. They also have a, a government fiat in play there where they, they get to go and just say this is what we're doing. Um, we have a little bit of a different model, and I'll explain that in a bit. Um, so there were four places left. At the time, World Wildlife Fund was spearheading a general you know, organization, conservation organization, consensus on could it be done, and if so, where. We ended up going to the Northern Great Plains because of several unique restoration uh, criteria. One, we have 95% of those grasslands intact up there. And it's basically just a coincidence of, of history um, because of the way it was settled and because cattle became the predominant um, uh, growth you know, from the earth. Um, why can't I think of the word? You know, when you think, mm, it'll come to me. Uh, we, we didn't till it here the way that we did in parts of Nebraska and Kansas and elsewhere. So 95%, that's huge. Then it's really necessary. If we don't have that particular percentage or at least near it, it's going to cost too much money to do. So that was huge in this area. Two, the unique wildlife history. We know from the stories of our Native American friends as well as the journals of Lewis and Clark and other famed early explorers that this was the place where they tripped over grizzly bears, where there were millions of bison where they saw and discovered species they'd never seen before. We want to get all of those back. And you could do it here and make it a place for people and wildlife to interact together in a great big nature reserve. And then third, and this is key, there was a big leverage opportunity. You could buy some private land which was attached to public land in a way that I'll explain in a minute and end up owning or controlling access to a large enough amount of land to make it possible without being overwhelmingly unaffordable, overwhelmingly expensive. As it is, this is going to be a, a several hundred million dollar project. And then finally, there were some continuing demographic changes in this project area. Starting at the end of World War I, we've been losing people in this demographic area at the rate of about 10% per decade. And that's just because the boom happened right as the railroads were developed and before the Dust Bowl. And then in this increasingly difficult place to live, 
people have said, you know what, I'd rather move my livestock elsewhere, or you know what, I'd rather relocate to a town a little warmer in the winter and a little cooler in the summer. It is a, a, a really um, incredibly harsh and gorgeous place, but it's not all that hospitable to people, for, especially long term. Uh, bison have no problem there. Wolves, they've got that. We need a lot of parkas and a lot of patience to get through some of this. So noting that continuing demographic change, we thought, okay, we actually could come up with a model where we could make this happen in a almost impossible, but not quite impossible way. So I talked about the unique leverage opportunity. Up here, this is our project area right here. Right there, it's that big. And you'll see this is Fort Belknap, the borders on the west and Fort Peck over on the east. Um, on this map, you see several colors. Uh, the first of which is this teal, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Many of you are familiar with the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge. 1.1 million acres, some of the best elk hunting in the world. And that existed at the time that World Wildlife was looking at this project and saying, could we do this anywhere? We already had 1.1 million acres of national wildlife land sitting right there. And then in 2000, Bill Clinton came out and put in place the Upper Missouri River uh, breaks National Monument. That's another 375,000. That made it almost a foregone conclusion. 1.5 million public acres for wildlife and recreation sitting there. What if we could build on that? So what we did was we took this as a springboard and looked at where the public, other public lands existed. And what we call the sunburst here, that goldenrod color, those are Bureau of Land Management lands, mostly federal. There's some state as well. This is what happened when people walked off the land after the Homesteading Act. This is what is left over from those lands. Does that make sense? If you know anything about, um, well, a lot of you have probably read a ton of this stuff, so I'm, I, you know, I'm going to go over Dick Manning and some other things here. But um, what happened with the Grazing Acts is that if you could uh, keep your particular portion of owned land, you could get access to some public land that was attached to it by mostly tradition, um, and now tradition becomes law. So in other words, we could buy up the white. The white in this project area is the public land. All we need is the white, and we could leverage the rest of the public land into one giant managed together space for wildlife and people. That sounds pretty good. That might be doable. It's only 500,000 acres. How much could that cost? Well, it costs plenty, but, uh, but it was feasible. So we said, okay, let's see if we can do this. Yeah? So the 500,000 acres, that's private. 500,000 acres of private land. And then you get access to the additional 1.5 million in public land, mostly BLM, and then you add it to the 1.5. See, you got it. You guys have got it. So if we're really going to do this, how do we make this a reality? How do we go from, boy, that sounds like a great idea, to well, how do we make this happen on the ground? And we established three areas of strategic focus. This is where we're going to need your guys' help. The first is habitat accumulation. We've got to buy the land. That part's, that takes money. We've got to fundraise for it. Then you've got to get the relationships going in order to you know, make sure that people want to sell to you. I'll get to that, too. Um, that part is actually the easiest part. The biodiversity restoration is one of the biggest challenges that we have, not only because you're dealing with three and a half million acres, but because you're managing it not as American Prairie Reserve, but as American Prairie Reserve in conjunction with all of the other state and national agencies which are already existing there. That's a trick, right? That requires great relationship management, sharing of ideas, and a lot of compromise. And then the third part is the human element, and I'll go through that as well. First, let's talk about habitat accumulation. This is a map of what we own right now. We actually just closed on a couple little properties that aren't on this map. I didn't have a chance to update it. But um, again, going on this private versus public model, if you look at the dark blue, the dark blue is what we, we uh, call our deeded land. In other words, we own it outright. That is land that we own. The light blue is the BLM or state public land that is associated with it. So all told, we have 307,000 acres at this time of land that we are working with. And 
the one that we call the, um, the model home version of the prairie. The one you guys want to come up and visit is an area right here it's called Sun Prairie. Um, and it's on that, some maps that I made available at the start of the room. But basically what we've been doing is buying up and securing as we can in a patchwork format in order to get it all to come together. So we're at 307,000 acres. We've raised $75 million so far. And that's been done through 22 transactions. Um, some of them are land swaps. We're pretty, you know, we're pretty, um, we're pretty flexible. Again, that may, that may require hundreds of millions of dollars to be raised, but it's the easy part. This is tricky. So imagine a space like this, where at one time, even 10 years ago, we had fences running all through here. You had a, a rest rotation system for cattle. You had over by the water, some of the, you know, the, the grass is looking a little tough over there because we know cows like to accumulate over by the water. I would too if I needed that much of it. Um, and imagine what it would be like to be on the ground and to take out fences and to let wildlife go through and re-engineer the ecosystem. That's what we get to do. And this is one portion of Sun Prairie, although there are a ton of, of, of portions. Uh, and they all look very different. But how do we actually do this? We work with agencies. We work with um, the Bureau of Land Management is a big one because, boy, that's their land, right? We're just hoping to, to manage it in a bigger vision. We're not hoping to buy up the Bureau of Land Management land. We're not hoping to buy our land and donate it to the federal government. The federal government can't afford that. Um, we're looking to do it as just a little bit of a different model. We also work with um, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. We work with FWS, Fish, Wildlife Service. Um, we work with the Department of Natural Resources. Oh, we work with um, a startup in town called Adventures and Scientists for Conservation, and they're an adventure science volunteer group um, where they bring people who walk 10-mile transects and do um, baseline data collection for us in terms of wildlife numbers. Uh, we work with universities. Um, we work with the Global Owl Project. We have people coming from the Forest Service. We have people come and visit and learn more about what it's like to be out on the prairie from um, you know, in inner city New York kids who, who think Central Park is, is wild, right? So we, we try to partner with as many organizations as we possibly can to make this a reality. And what we really need you guys to help us do is find ways where your personal interests can align with our interests so that we can get things going. And I can go through a little bit more of that. How do we actually make the ground more natural? Uh, how do we actually rehabilitate the ground? And how do we bring back wildlife? Again, this is our big challenge. We have used, we've developed and used something called the Frazee Scale. And this is something that Kurt Frazee, um, who used to work with World Wildlife Fund and was one of the funders, founders on the project, developed for us. I have copies of it in the back if you're interested along with our bison report, which tells you a little bit about the 620 bison that we have on the ground right now and where we're going to grow that to, how we plan to do that if you're interested in bison. So basically, the Frazee scale is what we use for uh, measuring the health of our current land and getting uh, that land to move further from being managed for cash crops, you know, or, or beef in this case, to being managed for wildlife. Um, we look for things like natural grazing patterns, fire. We look for um, resiliency to periodic weather extremes, which is going to be an increasing factor going forward. We look for predator populations. Uh, we, we try to look at habitat connectivity, um, movement of wildlife, all of these things. And we use the Frazee scale uh, not only on our own land, but on lands of ranchers that we partner with. And I'll get to that in a moment as well. So this is us doing some work out there. Um, we have an independent contractor come out and help us verify so that we're not rating our own land in a certain way. They help us verify what our land looks like and, and help us move it over from manage for cash crop or, um, you know, or cattle over to wildlife as well. So let's say we took a dry fork unit. Dry fork is one of our western units. And we said, you know, the soil's looking OK. We're going to give it a 3 out of 7. But we haven't had any fires. You know, we can't conduct any fires because there's people living there, et cetera. Um, ungulates, man, you know, they're, they're getting harvested a lot. We don't have a, a great number. There are no predators out there. So you know, we're rating a 23 out of 70. 
Well, that's a start, but how do we move that further to the right? Um, so again, if you're interested in the, um, it was published in Ecological Restoration in December of 2014, and it's in the back if you're interested. And if I run out, let me know. I can get you some more copies. So that's how we look at the land and how we move it from the way it's been managed to the way that we want to manage it. How do we make it more wild? Well, part of how we make it more wild from a wildlife perspective is we use the ecological engineers like bison and prairie dogs. Those are huge keystone species for the plains. And right now we've got 620 bison. We imported 16 in 2005 and have been growing them ever since. And these are conservation stock bison. You know, to the, to the best test that exists today, they are free of cattle gene introgression. So we'd like to grow that up to 10,000 or more, um, at which point we would open them up to public hunting because we'll need help getting that population to stay where, where it needs to be. Um, and all of our lands now are open for hunting. Um, and we want to we want to continue that. That's a big part of our mission. So we know that we used to have, you know, 50,000 or more bison in just the particular lands that we have collective right now, right? I mean, there were millions on the Great Plains. But even in just the little, the little bit of land that we own, we know that those estimations were way, way higher. We'd like to get that to 10,000. And I'm sure we'll get some questions on that. That's fine. Elk? Man, you're looking at seven, 8,000 in that area? We wanted it at 12, 5 or higher. Historically, it was much higher. Uh, same with pronghorn. Pronghorn had that tough 2012 winter. They are still not back. Um, we're working on that. Uh, and I've got some notes on if you guys are interested in any of the ungulates, uh, let me know. We've got some things we need to do there. We'd like to see 15,000 there. So that's some information on biodiversity restoration. The human element is key. I talked about public access. We do offer public hunting through Fish and Wildlife Block Management Program. We will continue to do so. We see that as a key difference in this park versus other national parks. We, of course, will not be a national park, but we will be a park which is national in scale. We will be the largest park in the lower 48. Um, and we will operate much the same way. Come in and camp. Come in and, you know, hike around and don't touch the bison and, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but we have offered uh, 3,500 hunter days back in, this is our 2014 number. We haven't figured out 2015 yet. Three quarters of whom were Montana residents. That's fantastic. We love seeing that. Um, and we offer a buffalo camp. Uh, this is a BLM style campground, 12 bucks a night. Come on by. Sleep under the aurora and wake up with the bison. Awesome. We even have running water there now. You can't drink it, but it runs. Um, we also just opened in April our Enrico Education and Science Center. This is an important thing for you guys to know about because this is where we house uh, people who are coming up to do laboratory work with us. And so we've got a couple of rooms there. It's a really nice place to stay which is good because otherwise there's buffalo camp or nothing, you know. And it's your BLM land. You can pitch a tent anywhere on it you want. Um, but I like to know what I'm sleeping under you know, or around. So um, if you would like something with a running shower, I advise this. Uh, this is where we, again, host collaborators. I can't say, come and we'll put you up and it's no problem because it gets full. So we'd have to have a, a collaborator agreement where you guys are doing research that's important to us as well as important to you. Does that make sense? We don't rent it out. We couldn't because it gets full. But we're interested in, how, in having you there. Um, and then we track very carefully our economic impact in the area, in part because what we're doing is not without controversy. You're actually asking a huge swath of Montana to change land use in a way which totally changes how they perceive themselves. We would argue we didn't start that change. That change preceded us by 60, 70, 80 years. But we are taking advantage of that. We are leveraging the change in demographics. We are leveraging the fact that people don't want to come back to that ranch and live up there in those really harsh conditions. We do take advantage of that in order to move this from a place that is managed for livestock to a place that's managed for all of us for the wild, right? So we take really good care to track as much and spend as much as we can in the sixth project area, particularly Phillips County, which is where a bunch of our land now is located. Um, in 2014, we spent $2.1 million. We, we buy pickup trucks. We buy office paper for the Bozeman office. We pay wages, taxes, et cetera. That $2.1 million does not include land purchasing, by the way. Um, but all told, we've spent more than $30 million in the project area over the course of now almost 15 years. So we spend a lot of money in that area 
in, in part to help people understand that we want to be good neighbors and that we understand that by taking a cow off some of these lands, you have the potential to take a tax off, right? So let's make sure that we're not leaving the schools unfunded or any of those other things. We've thought through how to get that done and how to make a difference there. We also have great relationships with the local tribes, particularly on Fort Belknap, just because it's so much closer to our hub of activity than Peck is, although we have, we have friends over in Peck too. Um, but we've, we've done a, a good job over the last 10 years in particular of showing up and communicating with, uh, the, with the people that we've met there over the years and asking if we can bring people who have similar needs to them and to us, uh, if we can just bring people together. That's really our only ask of them. Um, we also do some bison work together. They're a fantastic resource. They call us if they need us. In short, we feel like that's a real bright spot for us, uh, and we look forward to a time when we're actual physical neighbors. Right now, our properties don't exactly abut, but they will. Um, so I can talk more about that if you have any questions. Um, I want to take a minute and talk a little bit ab about what we call the Montana Triangle. You've noticed in the, in the blue, the blue is, is where there's less light pollution, less traffic, uh, fewer homes, less population in general. This is what we know to be a lot of our wildlife through fairs, through thoroughfares in the state. We'd also like to think of it as a tourism triangle. Our goal eventually is to have grizzlies come over from Glacier, wolves come up from Yellowstone, and tourists to do all three. Right? Come to Montana, you see Glacier and Yellowstone, we need you to add a park. We want you to come to the prairie and get a sense of that American Serengeti. So we see all of these towns within and along uh, this triangle as being benefit, potential beneficiaries of another giant national park style place in Montana. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about future infrastructure. Right now we're in the planning stages of building a 200 plus mile hut to hut system. This is particularly um, exciting if you've been to Scotland or parts of Africa that do these and they do them really well. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful system where 50 bucks a night, say, you get a nice cabin and there's running water and then you, you set off the next day with your compass and you know 10 miles later on foot or 20 miles on bike, your next hut is waiting. And it's warm and it's out of the elements, but in the meantime, you are out there with nothing around you except nature. And it is, it's so compelling. I've done several of these longer treks and they're just, they reset you in ways that are really amazing. Um, we also have uh, plans for a new interpretive center and campground complex on Highway 191. Um, so that's in the works right now. These are longer term things because they take time, but we'd like to build three to, like to, build three to five additional campgrounds in that BLM style. Uh, and then we need to put a ton more signage up there to help people interpret the land. Um, we're going as fast as we can on that, but we, we're also in heavy fundraising mode because it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to get this done. Um, and then, of course, we're removing hundreds of miles of fences, interior fences, to allow the wildlife to move as freely as possible. The reality is, though, this project will always be in a head of almost half a million head of cattle. Even when we move them off of the property, it's not like they go out of production. They're going to move to the outskirts. And so we have to have an understanding of this and a, and a plan for this. We call our plan softening the boundaries. And the reason you need to soften these boundaries is twofold. It works better than, say, in Gardner, Montana, where you have that hard boundary with the bison and the ranchers. It works better to have relationships with your neighbors where there's mutual respect and trust. It works better so that the, the grizzlies can come over and not get shot coming into the prairie, and the wolves can come up and not get shot coming into the prairie, if you incentivize these ranchers to understand that wildlife can be more than a cost. In fact, wildlife shouldn't be a cost. Wildlife should be an asset to all of us. How do you get that done? This is probably one of the biggest things that we're working on right now. Well, to increase what we call the social care carrying capacity for wildlife, we started a beef company. Um, so we are now conservationists who, who own a beef label. And that had been tried in the 1990s, if any of you remember the conservation beef model. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a good model, but we've been able to talk to the people who, who perform some of those and tweak it a little bit. We call the label Wild Sky. And essentially what we do is we sell 100% hormone-free, grass-fed, et cetera, 
beef at an annual price premium, and we take the proceeds from that beef, and we give it back to producers on the land around our project area who sign up to be Wild Sky Ranchers. In return, we use the same Frazy scale that we use on our land to measure them to take it from Manage for Livestock over to Manage for Wildlife. And the deal is, the further they move in that point system, remember the score of 23 out of 70? Let's say next year they get a 30. They go from getting six cents per pound for their beef to nine cents per pound for their beef. And so we're moving them further down in terms of profitability for additional wild management. Yeah? Can you say a little bit more about the sale model for the conservation beef? So does it include the beef that the rangers sell the beef to market and get that market cost? And then there's this additionality with partnering with Wild Sky Co-op. I don't know if that's quite the right word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's close enough. Great question. So the question was, um, how, does the, how does the model actually work? We don't have to buy beef from within the project area in order for it to work. We have purchased beef from within the project area, but actually that project area couldn't support the 50,000 pounds of beef per month that we're selling, and that's only going to grow. So we actually source most of our beef from uh, other parts of the plains that are already, already tilled up and working for us in terms of food production. Um, but the proceeds, just like when you buy Paul Newman salad dressing or Cherry Garcia ice cream, the proceeds still go back to funding this work on behalf of these ranchers, which in turn is on behalf of wildlife. So it, it, it's a, it, it takes a little bit of an intellectual jump to close that loop, but essentially the price premium that we get for selling the beef goes back into um, the ranchers' pockets. And these are um, high four-figure and low five-figure checks annually. So it makes a big difference in a place where if you're running 200 head of cattle up there, you're making $35,000 a year. I can give you 10 grand if you want to move up that crazy scale a year. Let's do that, right? We can make a real difference. And they deserve to stay in the project area doing what they love as long as they want. And I mean that. They can stay as long as they want. We're prepared to have inholdings for the rest of the time. It does, that part doesn't matter to us. What matters to us is that the vision doesn't get compromised because we failed to do the work with relationships on the ground. Does that make sense? So anybody studying psychology or sociology, let me know. OK. Um, did that answer your question? Absolutely. Mostly? OK. I'm really excited to learn about the minutia, but I don't want to derail. OK. Let's do, because I love talking about it. The idea is that the core reserve and the ranchers both win. We need to make this something that is a win-win for people. We can't just decide that we're going to do it our way and screw everybody. One, that's not part of uh, American Prairie Reserve's core values. Two, it's not good business. Come on, we're better than that, right? So this is our Wild Sky rant, uh, label. You'll see here it has the swift fox jumping, and it says supporting wildlife-friendly ranching. That is a, um, a first for the beef industry. We own that trademark. Um, it's, the, it's the first time it's ever been done. Um, and we just yesterday, in fact, um, my colleague Laura was over in Spokane finishing up the deal with uh, Rose Hours Supermarket, so you'll be able to get the beef here in Bozeman starting January 25th, and we're pretty excited about that. You can already get the jerky on Amazon, um, and, you know, we, we also had deals with Meyer and a bunch of other big time, um, but we haven't been able to get it here in Bozeman until now, so I'm a little excited. So. This is locations offering MPH products. MPH is our, um, is our business. It's called Montana Prairie Holdings. It's the business that Wild Sky is under. Because when you're a, a, you know, a nonprofit and you're running a for-profit, you have to do things like this. So this is where we're distributing right now. And then we just got a bunch more stores in here. This is 11 stores with Rose Hours. Um, so you can know that that's going as well. Our Wild Sky ranchers uh, get paid per, per pound as they move up the Frazy scale, but they also have an opportunity to put a, a camera trap out and catch a predator wandering through. You get a mountain lion, that's 250 bucks. We'll just pay you. We'll cut you a check. We have people check the trap. They send us a picture. We put it on social media. We cut you a check. We love this. We love this. Black bear, 300 bucks. One rancher, one month, 550 additional dollars just because his ranch was, was suitably friendly to wildlife. Interestingly, and this was during the summer where there could have been some predation, there was none. They did not have problems with these, you know, with these animals. Now, the other part of Wild Sky is not just the economic model. 
It's the intelligence model. It's hacking at the predation problem, right? So when you're talking about predation, you need to talk about ways that you can put people on the ground. I don't care if it's people or it's, or it's dogs or it's flashing lights that have been used elsewhere, but let's work together. Let's calve later in the spring. Let's pull those calves in closer to the homestead during the really vulnerable months. Let's put a range rider out there. Let's do whatever it takes so that ranchers can feel as though they can live amongst wildlife again without it being a cost to them. That doesn't mean there's not predation. We have had instances of predation on a wild sky ranch. That has happened. But instead of the old conservation beast model, where, you, where the, the rancher comes and he, here's my dead calf, and the conservationist goes, yeah, wolf got my calf. Yeah, sorry about that. Here's 400 bucks. Well, everybody leaves angry, or at least upset, right? Because $400 may have been what the dead calf was worth, but he would have been worth 1000 or more in November, right? So everybody's losing here, and we go away angry. Instead, we're paying you to work with us to be intelligent about preventing predation on your terms, on your ranch. And then we're trying to figure out you know, how we pay you in advance to take that risk, but see it as a good investment, a good risk to take, as opposed to, you know, the other. And anytime they want, they can sell their beef with that wildlife friendly label. It's a big hit in stores. Um, okay, so I want to let you know a couple of things. One, we have, um, I forgot just this one. Meh. We have donors in all 50 states. We're really proud to be widely supported um, by donors in all 50 states, 12 nations. 17% um, of our donors, in fact, come from the state of Montana. That makes us pretty happy. Um, and they range from people who give us $5 a year to people who give us a million or more um, at one time. And that's, again, because this is going to be such an expensive project that we do seek out uh, people at that higher level. We make no apologies for that. It's necessary. Uh, it also inspires them to be part of something where they just get to give money with no quid pro quo and come and enjoy something that they help turn public. And I think that that's the best ask out there. I get to make that ask, and I love making that ask. I get to say, you can do something that, that's utterly vanity-free. How would that feel? And, and our donors love that. Um, but we do get a little, we do get, you know, when you raise as much money as we've raised, you get people who say, gosh, there's that big money. You know, there's that big organization with all this big money coming in. And, uh, and that's not true. We have thousands of donors, again, that range from five bucks a year on up. Um, I'm one of them. Um, so, and I can't give a million dollars a year. I would love to. So that is our basic model. Um, and I, I want to say, first of all, thank you for giving me the time to talk through it, because it is complicated. It hasn't really been done before. And, and I'm sure you have questions. But I hope it's given you a place to start in terms of understanding um, the unique opportunities available to scientists, particularly because as we own much of the private land, then we can do um, pretty much anything we want on there. Uh, and then as we have um, access to the rest of that public land, there are so many needs for that public land that we can then help you with your own agenda, research agendas, work with other people as well to get some things accomplished. So, questions? Yeah, I have a question. Could you talk a little bit about some of the ongoing research that, that is already going on? Okay. So. So a lot of what we're doing, uh, we work actually pretty closely with Andrea Litt and Ecology on, um, on a lot of the wild sky related social change needs. Uh, we have to track predators and figure out where they're moving so that we can uh, hack some of the predation problems. Um, some of them exist, some of them never have a chance to exist, but uh, we need to figure out, right now we're working on, uh, with Smithsonian, getting a uh, wildlife restoration success benchmark on APR versus other ranchers, other ranch land versus um, grass bank land, right? So different conservation models and what has that meant for wildlife numbers, um, wildlife baselines. Um, we're working on um, how to, you know, prevent and reduce predator um, confrontations. We've also worked on what one of our Clemson grad students is working on what the bison um, mean to the land in terms of plant biodiversity. So we've had bison on one patch of land for 10 years, on another patch for five years, and then we're, uh, we're studying a third patch where they are not existent, 
what has that meant for biodiversity over that time? Um, what has it meant, not just from a, a plant biodiversity, but, but birds? Um, we're actually working with um, the Institute on, I'm going to get it wrong, Soundscapes at Purdue University um, to get a, using birdsong to get a benchmark for um, what healthy looks like in this, you know, in this um, ecosystem. Um, so that's exciting. We've had a number of um, soundscape artists come up and help us do some recordings to figure that out. Um, and that's a, very, that's a very popular thing because it's immediately accessible to people, right? You don't even need a, a background in science to understand how cool that is. Um, we need some help on bighorn sheep and pronghorn populations. So we have, um, we have a need there. We do not have enough people to do that yet. Uh, we've been doing with the um, Defenders of Wildlife, and I'm going to get it wrong. Nope, it's Defenders of Wildlife. We did a trial for a vaccine for prairie dogs, which we hope then will help with the black-footed ferret population problem because, uh, you know, you get a prairie dog pound big enough and they plague out, and then you don't have enough um, of a population to get the blackfoot ferrets healthy enough. You need, I think it's 100,000 acres. It's huge. You give them to about 10 right now, and they plague out, and you have to start over. So we've been doing plague vaccination trials. That was last summer. Um, what else are we doing? Oh, right, sage grouse. We work extensively on sage grouse. We have 19 leks, which we believe have about 500 birds associated with them. We continue to monitor that um, and do as much as we can to, to ensure that, um, that our own processes aren't screwing with that, which is not easy, as you know. Um, and then we want to see whether there's um, raptor predation happening on the reserve. But again, Smithsonian is going to help us with that, but we're looking for additional partners. We can't do it all ourselves. Um, we're going to reintroduce the swift fox in the fall, and that's pretty exciting for us. It's also a long-term, complicated, quasi-depressing um, thing, because in order to really get that swift fox in, you don't put a pair of breeding swift fox out once and say, go get them, fellas. You're going to have to do it again and again and again and again to get them to stick. Um, but that's been a process, and that's an example of where we've needed Fish Wildlife Service to come in and, and say, OK, well, you've proven with your camera traps that there aren't any existing breeding pairs. You can go ahead. So they're, you know, they, are, they are very cautious. They manage right now those wildlife populations for livestock. So we have to go in and, and, and educate on you know, what exists and doesn't exist and how we can create those partnerships going forward. Uh, let's see. We are comparing techniques to expand prairie dog towns. Um, we've tried a couple of things this past summer and we're monitoring. So far, so good. It's as simple as running some PVC pipe up and mowing the grass and saying, come on over, guys. But you've got to do that. And you've got to know how to do it and when um, and to get them to kit out a little further. Uh, we are trying to test proactive ways to reduce competition with, um, with those um, predators, particularly uh, mountain lions and um, bear. And then with our bison, um, you know, when you, grow, when you grow a herd of bison from 16 to 620, you're doing annual SNP tests for everything from brucellosis to blue tongue, et cetera. Uh, and there's always more work that can be done monitoring the health of that herd. Uh, we're getting ready to split the herd into another portion of the reserve, in part because then they can help us um, engineer it, right? And in part because you run 620 on Sun Prairie, it may be 31,000 acres. But it's, you know, you start to think, all right, that's about enough. Um, so, yep, that's a good one. Bobcat and cougars. Um, a, a lot of it is, is predation. Because again, you put this up in cattle country, and you've got to figure out how to how to make that work for everybody. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm, Montana has a long history of um, out of state wealth influencing, I guess, the politics of the state, and there's been a lot of concern voiced. I know about raising, you know, the, the rising property values that you guys have initiated. Hmm. And also concerns that this might become some sort of a part for elite interests. How do you respond to those concerns? Those are great questions. Two things. One, uh, this will never be a park for elite interests because the the purpose of 
the American Prairie Reserve is very specifically to open up all the lands to the public, period. No quid pro quo, no special interest getting special favors, none of that. The people who give money, and some of them do give a lot of money, expect nothing other than that we open this up to people. That period. That's mission critical, that's not negotiable. Secondly, when it comes to raising land prices, we've looked at that because we, we get that question and we don't wanna run up the land prices because it means we'll end up paying more, right? I can tell you two things that typically help people feel more confident that we're not running up the land prices. And I've seen the numbers and I can tell you that we're not, but the two ways that I would, that, okay, let's talk, let's talk. Um, but the, the two ways that I, would, that I would prove it is that one, we can't buy land for more than it ends up being appraised for. Does that make sense? And so you can't go in and outbid someone and then have your bank say, yeah, sure, go ahead and pay double what this is worth. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. That's not good business. And two, we lose half of the bids we go out on. We get about half. We lose the other half. To me, that tells us we're not paying too much and, and that you know, it would be in our own worst interest to, to get that, that land up. But you, you, you know, the point that I would make there is, look, people know if they want to sell that there is you know, a, a group that is interested in buying property. So does that change how they think about selling and when they sell? Yeah, maybe, maybe. We, we kind of make no, no general apologies for that because that's part of what it takes to get it done. But yeah, let's follow up on more because I want to see your numbers, yes. So moving into the future for funding, is it all still going to be donors, or then is there a point where visitation is going to be trying to ah, contribute a significant? Great question. Here? Yes, donors. Um, we we raise from individuals and foundations, and going forward, we have a um, a budget of that several hundred million number, 125 million of which is an endowment that we're creating to throw off roughly six or seven million a year to cover the expenses of operating the park, right? Will some of that be recouped at a minimal level by visitation? Yes, but we know our national parks right now don't recoup anywhere near what they need, right? You can't run a park on visitation, particularly one that's really far out there in a, in a lot of people's minds. So we anticipate that paying for itself based on the endowment rather than, um, rather than visitation alone. Yes. Other questions? I know there are more. Yes. So um, based on my personal experience in working in these areas, uh, my feeling is that the perception of the local communities is not very positive. i give you an example. I think it was two years ago I was in an extension park, given an extension park in Malta, which is just a few miles ago. Sure. Um, and the, I was talking about something totally different. and the. Uh, County Station agent started by saying that there's this group of people coming from outside the state, uh, bringing a lot of money, buying a lot of properties, bringing bison and wolves, and um, basically driving ranchers out of production, and therefore starting the war. So they, they're basically putting um, you know, a framework of fear, and there were around, I say, 50 ranchers, farmers mm -hmm. in that audience, and everyone was nodding their head mm -hmm. and saying, right. So, um, you know, when, when you talk about the partners you are having, you did not include a local community. Mm -hmm. So how do you address that? Is how do we address that? Connect? Because you're still buying 50% of the properties. Yep. You say, we lose 50%. They perceive as, you know, you buying 50% of the available properties, that will allow them to then create into public land. Yep. That's a great question, and it's one that I think about all day, every day, um, particularly because of, of my role as, as doing outreach and, and trying to talk to people about what it is we stand for and what it is we don't. And unfortunately, in communities like this, and I've worked in agriculture all my career, there is a lot of fear of change. And that is just part of the socio uh, structure, the social structure of places like that. Again, we are not, um, you know, instituting that change, but we are benefiting from it. And we're not, we don't, it's not that we don't understand that, and it's not that we're not appreciative of that, but we like to tell people, look, 
we're trying to be good neighbors. We try to do as much as we can to partner with you. Um, if you want to stay on the land, we want you to stay on the land. If you want to join with Wild Sky and, and help make wildlife pay for, for you and your family, we want to do that too. But this has changed. We have different ways of viewing what that land should be, what that land should do. I wouldn't expect them to make an apology for that. And we don't really make an apology for that either. But we do try to be really sensitive to it. The other thing I will say is that there is always more misinformation than good information out there, uh, particularly around Malta, and that there had been one complicating factor. And if this hadn't happened, boy, I would feel better about things. But back in 2001, I believe, there was a memo that got leaked out of, um, I think it was the BLM, and uh, it, it talked about whether there was going to be a new national monument established in our project area. And this is nothing that we had anything to do with. We didn't even know about it, but it got out, and everybody said, see, they're with the federal government. And this is all a federal conspiracy. And this is Fort Peck Dam all over again, right? And the, the people who live up there have a right to feel that way. If you read the history, there have been displacements. There's been unfair treatment. I, if I lived up there, I'd be suspicious too. But when they get to know us over a kitchen table, and we do that all the time, we do that every day with our neighbors, they find us to be good neighbors with a different vision. They find us to be nice people who are willing to bend over backwards. We did have some problems initially when we introduced the bison. There was a ton of fear, brucellosis, right? Oh my gosh, all of that fear. And three years later, we, we introduced another round of bison, and we went back to the same group of neighbors we'd seen before we introduced the first round. We, we sat down, and we, we had kitchen table memorandums of understanding. We said, look, that bison comes on your land, shoot it. You don't need to call us. If it's looking at you funny, you shoot it. If you've got a problem with it, you shoot it. We don't, we don't want it to be a problem to you. We understand that it can be controversial. We're here to bend over backwards because we understand this has changed. We went back three years later with the second, re second reintroduction of bison, and they all said, you know what, you guys manage a good herd. We haven't had problems. We don't anticipate having problems. We're good. And slowly we have seen that needle move, but it is slow. And that is the pace of rural America. Rural America's pace is a little slower. That's not good or bad or different. It just is. Um, and so what I would say is that we haven't always taken the time as an organization that we needed to to build those bridges, um, but that we're working harder than we ever have to do that. And for example, we're, um, we're hoping to partner with, uh, there's a trail alliance in Malta um, that we're hoping to partner with. Uh, we're doing some outreach there. We have a lot of other plans to, to do that. And it helps that we have people who live and work full time up there, who send their kids to school up there. But at the end of the day, we have a different view for the land. So I understand, I understand that that change is difficult. I, I, can't, I can't change that part of it. Yeah? Have you thought about moving your headquarters to Malta? We would love to move our headquarters to Malta. Yes, we consider the reserve our headquarters. Down here, we have a development office, and it's very simple. The airport is here. We do a lot of flying around asking people for money. I can't wait till that part is over. I can't wait. Lewistown's been, off, been at us for years to move up there and do it that way. That would be cool, too. Yeah, there are a lot of things we could do. We just need a couple hundred million dollars first. Seven hundred. Uh, or so. Um, this kind of piggybacks off of your concern about local communities and making sure that they're a part of the conversation. Sure. And you showed that diagram of the triangle and mm -hmm. hopes that people um, we'll add the American Prairie Reserve to their, our, their vacations that already go between Yellowstone and Glacier. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's been outreach to communities along that route. The, not necessarily the Yellowstone to Glacier, which is probably accustomed to some of the impacts that will likely um, I know will be brought on, but have the other two legs of the triangle, has there been outreach to those communities about potential impacts? Yep, great question. The answer is yes. Um, we do them routinely. We hold three or four events a year doing that. Um, yeah. Well, we've done them in most recently, and we went over to Great Falls this last time, but we do Lewistown at least once a year. Um, we've been doing them in Bozeman just to get people you know, to understand that we're here, because for a long time they didn't. 
Um, and then we're going to uh, Billings and to the reserve area again this year. Um, so we, we do them as often as we can. Um, I guess my inclination is to be more concerned with places that aren't Billings or Great Falls or Bozeman, mm -hmm. but to be concerned with some of the smaller communities that might be inundated with tour bus traffic sure. and um, all of the great things that come with that. All of the complicated things that come with that. And there, are, there are great things about it, but you know, it, it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Well, um, but if we don't have those relationships established now, if we're not working on that, do we expect them to happen overnight? No. Um, Lewistown has been a, a great area of support for us, not only because they see themselves as a gateway community to this eventual park, but because it's um, populated with a lot of, strangely, kind of former um, Alaska wildlife um, operatives, for lack of a better word. You throw a stone in Lewistown and you hit somebody who works at a park in Alaska doing wildlife or doing ecology or whatnot. It's kind of a funny thing. It's like, it's like the Naples, Florida retirement home version of, of the Alaska scientist. So that's kind of fun. Um, and, and they get it in ways that, that maybe some people who feel as, you know, in the Malta area don't get it quite as readily. Um, but again, that's part of that change. Um, and that's part of why we, 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 take great pains to spend a lot of money in Malta and to, and to be as productive as we can from a tax base perspective as well. So are the communities along those lights of the triangle that are smaller um, mm -hmm. communities, are there local policymakers and community leaders invited to the meetings in Lewiston and the meetings in Great Falls? Oh yeah, no, we do a ton of outreach um, whenever we're in an area at any point. Um, but we also go to Helena when uh, things are in session, not to lobby because we've got enough to do. <laughs> we can't afford time to lobby as well, but just to, to give project updates. You know, here's where we are. Um, we have 620 bison. Here's the last time we tested them. This is the brucellosis test result. I'm not concerned with how long. I'm concerned with the small community. Sure. Um, to meet the representatives, as in the official political representatives, Helena works best. But you're right. And in terms of on-the-ground outreach, um, you know, we, we hold events in those towns as often as we can. Um, I've actually got plans to go to Jordan um, to meet with, because Jordan's tough, man. Jordan is one of those places where they, they still remember Fort Peck in a way that impacted them in an outsized fashion. And so you have to start those relationships now in order to eventually break down some of those trust barriers and let them understand that you're not here as the federal government to take their land. Does that make sense? That, and that is, it is a long-term <coughs> process, bless you. And it's one of the things that, that is unique about this project. You couldn't make that change in a five-year period. You could make it in a generation, and you could make it in two generations as long as you've got good, a good solid hand at the wheel. Does that make sense? It has to be a long-term thing. Yeah. Is there, is there part of uh, I mean, with these two iconic national parks, I guess, gateway airports there? So is there <clears throat> like part of the future vision then for Malta to have a pretty major airport? I mean, to get people access to this reserve? That's a great question. Um, we've thought about uh, different ways that we might impact tourism uh, in general in the area, <laughs> and. From what we've been able to tell, Great Falls is, uh, is, is ready and interested to do that. Malta is not so sure yet. Um, but they've also been on the receiving end of that changing population from a decreased perspective for so long that I think they would want to see those numbers go up first before they would be ready to say, yes, there's enough traffic here. We should commit to that. Does that make sense? Um, uh, I mean, in some ways, it seems like this is kind of accelerating that population decrease? Well, although with the services that will be required in and around, um, we're not sure about that. We, I mean, we obviously have, you know, employees up there as well, and, and a lot of people don't move out of the area. They just stop ranching and move to town. So you're not losing people as much as those ranches are, are going out as the next generation just often doesn't come back, right? And when they don't come back and, and they need to sell, they can consider us, because we work on that willing buyer, willing seller model, as an option. Um, 
So is that the model willing, willing? Absolutely, yeah. Willing buyer, willing seller. It's the only way to do it. I, could you do it with a government fiat? I guess. I don't think that's fair. So are there inholdings there where the rancher is not um, interested in doing this wildlife-friendly conservation? You bet. Beef and so what? You bet. More power to them. Okay. So then they just keep ranching their operation like they always have. You bet. Yeah, because that should be first and foremost their decision. That's right. not so for us to decide. The... Absolutely. If they're following all of the, you know, block management hunting laws and whatever, absolutely. Yeah, we don't want to be a burden to them. We believe we offer opportunity. We also know that it's our flavor of opportunity and that it's not for everyone and we're not trying to be biased or arrogant or weird about it. So, you know, when you have a different vision for a place and it's one of four remaining places in the world to do something at that scale, we think it's worth doing. Well, I think that, um, I, you know, listening, I hear, uh, I mean, every minute I was thinking of another possible research project <laughs> uh, on the ecology, on the wildlife, on the population biology, on the social issues, Good. on the marketing issues, mm. on the community development issues, on the, the music. well, every discipline that I can think of could think of something that they uh, could imagine doing some research related. We've discussed about... Um, uh, putting together some sort of field trip yep. where uh, researchers from Bozeman can, we can travel up to the reserve and kind of get a field, you know, see what's on the ground. Um, and so we we uh, we don't have anything set yet, but we're thinking maybe toward the end of the summer, uh, trying to put that together. So, uh, but in the meantime, I encourage everyone to think about how, you know, what, you know, what could I do there uh, that would be interesting to me, that that would be, you know, valuable to science and valuable to the reserve, value to the community. Um, so uh, that's, uh, I encourage everyone to think about that. And reach out to the American Prairie Reserve uh, and uh, so we can start these dialogues going and start coming up with some collaboration agreements. Yes, thank you. My card's on the back table, so just grab one and hit me up anytime. And my husband teaches here, so I'm here a lot. So. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.